Hello and welcome to this Essentials Primer video on features. It is the third part and final part of the Essentials Primer video series. My name is Robert French and I'm an Applications Engineer at Go Engineer. Alright, so SolidWorks features. In the last video we went over creating 2D sketches on flat faces or planes. SolidWorks features utilizes those sketches in order to translate them from kind of 2D geometry into a final 3D volume or shape. Different types of features, the typical ones and the ones you'll practice on in the Essentials class are Extrude, Revolve, and Sweep, though there are additional ones. Sketches can be edited after feature creation, and I feel the need to point that out because too often in class is an error made on a sketch, whether it's wrong dimension or wrong geometry, and people feel the need to delete it. We can always go back and edit these sketches uh, and make the changes in order to achieve correct geometry, correct dimensions. Some features, however, do not require sketches. The most typical examples would include things like fillets and chamfers, right? We're just choosing an, exi an existing uh, part edge to uh, kind of edge break that, round it off, chamfer it off. But we also have things like shell um, and a few others that, once again, do not require sketches. There's a couple different modeling methods, different ways we can organize our features or, or different orders in which we can use our features. One of the most common ways, simple ways, is the layer cake approach. So imagine like a wedding cake starting off with that large uh, a wide diameter bottom uh, done through an extrude. And then we can add additional extrudes on top of that in kind of a layered cake approach until we reach our final part. We have the potter's wheel approach which is kind of the, the simplest or, or most efficient, everything kind of organized in one place, one sketch where we see everything. And then lastly, we kind of have the manufacturing method, which is uh, useful for people that are working in machine shops or are worried about the manufacturing process. We actually start by modeling one huge cylinder that encompasses all of our part. That would kind of be like a raw stock to a machinist. And then each additional step kind of shows machining operations, like turning down on a lathe for the different steps in the part we see there. And once again, that can just be helpful for machinists to understand the different steps and, and different uh, uh, paths that a part might go along to go from stock to final part. The first feature. So with our first feature that we create in a SOLIDWORKS model, we want to try to capture the main profile or the backbone, as much information about the part as possible. So you can see in the infographic there on the right, two columns, the final part being in the column on the left. And then the column on the right is the first sketch or the first feature created. And you can see in each example, we're trying to capture as much of the, you know, backbone of the part as possible. This makes it easier for linking other features on top of them, making them parametrically linked, making things update uh, automatically, and, and having some automation within the model. So it can be a, a huge step up if we really capture a good profile on that first feature. We want to make sure we uh, model it in a orientation that makes sense. So a simple example is a table. When I hit an isometric view on a table, I expect to see it how I might see it in real life. Tabletop up, four legs pointing down. What I don't want to see when I hit isometric is the tabletop facing the ground and four legs sticking straight up into the air. This isn't a concrete rule, but it's usually a, a, a general guiding principle that uh, uh, makes more sense when modeling things. If we do happen to model it incorrectly, much like our sketches, we can go back and change our sketches, edit them, change their dimensions. We can also flip the orientation of our part by re, uh, re-choosing which plane or which orientation we chose to model it in. I really encourage people not to delete stuff. There's usually a way we can salvage some of the work that's already been done. And then just a, uh, a little repeat from our uh, uh, second video in this series from sketching try to tie that first sketch to the origin. All right, feature end conditions. So for extrude, how far do we take this 2D sketch? What's the depth we want to take this 2D sketch to? We have a couple different options that uh, we can choose. Uh, blind would just ask us for a simple value. How far do I want to take this? One inch, two inch, three inch, whatever it may be. Through all, you know, takes it as far as the model extends. That's more typical on like a cut extrude. You know, for instance, if I was cutting a hole and I want that hole to go all the way through the part, it's better to choose through all on that uh, hole feature than it is to say use blind or one of the other end conditions. And I'll 
show you why that makes sense when we jump into the software for a practical look. For something like Revolve, though, we deal in degrees. How many degrees do I want to spin uh, this particular sketch about an axis? Once again, we'll take a look at this in the software. More often than not, uh, on a Revolve, it's 360 degrees, that full rotation. But we'll take a look at that as well. And then lastly here, I want to talk about feature dependency. There's different features in the feature tree, and they can have different parent-child relations. Uh, different features can be organized on different faces of existing features. So if I had just a simple uh, cube or box, I don't have to tie a hole through that to a plane. I can actually tie it to one of the faces. Um, and so you can see the difference there, planes versus faces. So uh, you'll, you'll see how this can really automate a lot of your design or actually cause a couple problems. And I'll make sure I point out those distinctions in the software. All right, so here in the software, I want to go over a few of these topics uh, in a practical way. So in this first part, we have two sketches already, this simple square sketch and this simple circle sketch. Now I want to take this square sketch and do a revolve real quick, just to go over the different end conditions that we have in revolve. So revolve takes this square shape and rotates it about this axis. So right now, by default, we're set to 360 degrees, but we can vary that to different amounts as we go around our axis. Typically, this is probably either 90, 180, 270, 360. In this case, we'll use 360, and that would be the final result. Now, features use sketches, and when a feature uses a sketch, you can actually see in the feature tree here that the sketch has been absorbed, in essence, by the uh, feature. If I delete the feature, the sketch will still remain. And likewise, if I left the feature standing, I can actually go back and edit the sketch and see my feature update as well. Now, this time, I'll take this square and just extrude it a certain distance. Right now, I'm using the blind method. So I'm going one direction, and I can type in whatever value I might want that to be, two inches, three inches, whatever it may be. We can also use what's called the uh, mid-plane. It's another very typically used uh, uh, end condition. So once again, I'm still only going two inches, but you can notice the location of my sketch is right in the middle. I'm still two inches in depth, one inch going to the right, one inch going to the left. Let's switch back to blind, though, and leave it there. All right, now let's make use of this circle sketch. You can still see it here in the feature tree. The boss extrude one is utilizing sketch one, kind of absorbed it there. But now let's use sketch two. So I'll highlight it and say extruded cut. Now I'm going the wrong way with this feature, so if I were to try to check mark this right now, we get an error because we're trying to cut air essentially, and SolidWorks won't let us do that. We're not intersecting any of our existing volume. So over here in the feature tree, we'll stick with blind, but let's reverse the direction. Now we're cutting through our part, we're good to go. The issue here is the depth of this cut for this hole is two inches. That does go all the way through our part, but that's only because our part is two inches long. If we come back to this boss extrude feature, edit it by right clicking and choosing this top left icon for edit feature. If we go any longer than two inches, even only 10 thou here, that cut feature no longer makes it all the way through the part. My design intent with this feature is for it to go all the way through the part. So let's edit that cut extrude. And instead of saying blind, let's say through all you'll notice that we can no longer key in a value. This through all end condition is really nice because no matter what length I update this cube to be, this cut feature is always gonna find itself all the way through. And once again, we can edit sketch after the fact. So this circle's too small for me. That cut extrude is using sketch two. Let's edit sketch two by right clicking it, top left icon. And we can come into this sketch, increase the size of this hole, complete our sketch, and the feature updates. All right, one more quick, quick practical example. We talked about, you know, when we hit this isometric view, right, I can flip my part, my table, my really simple table here, so that it looks like it would in real life. Table legs facing down, table top up. But when I switch to my isometric view, which is kind of your nice, you know, photographic view, if you will, look at the orientation the table's in. It's a little awkward, right? 
Let's look at our dependencies real quick. If we right click the top of our feature tree, we can use these two buttons, dynamic reference visualization for parent and child. Let's go ahead and turn both of those on. So this first feature is for the tabletop, the first boss extrude of a two foot by six foot tabletop, one inch thick. And then we have our second feature, these table legs, sticking out a little over 19 inches. But when I highlight that feature in the feature tree with dynamic reference visualization turned on, we can see that this boss extrude is dependent upon boss extrude one. If I look at this sketch, the sketch for the table legs, it's sketched right onto this face of the bottom of the part. And I can really understand that by right clicking the sketch and not editing the sketch, but the next button over edit sketch plane. When I click that, we can see the face that this sketch was created on. That is why this boss extrude is dependent upon boss extrude one and not one of the three principal planes. What's nice about this is when I take the sketch for the tabletop and edit its sketch plane, and instead of being on the front, giving us that awkward orientation, if I switch it to the top, my table legs follow because my table legs are based off of this face. That face's orientation changed, and so my table legs followed with it. Now when I hit isometric view, I see the table like I would in real life. So that's it for the Essentials Primers course. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed it, and looking forward to see you in class. Thanks. Thank you.